Let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 20. Let's start a new chapter in our study on Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 20. We'll start with verse 1, but let's pray before we, do, before we get started. Father, thank you so much for so much wisdom we have, we have heard and have, we have access to in this wonderful book, especially that we have studied so far 19 chapters of really good stuff. I pray that you'd bless us tonight as well as we study and give us uh, insight and wisdom from thy word. We may see things that we did not see before, understand things we did not understand before, so we can make better decisions maybe than we've made before. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. This is a great verse. I remember teaching this to uh, young people, fifth graders, and well, not all, just fifth graders, but even other kids, anywhere, kids between the age of third grade through sixth grade, I used to teach, and I used to lead the singing in a, in a big junior church, or sometimes, one time we had a crowd of 1,000, can you imagine 1,000 kids between third grade and sixth grade? And I had to preach to them one time and teach them a lesson. And uh, it's pretty, pretty, it was a pretty amazing thing. And uh, many of them sitting on the floor because we didn't have seats for them. Uh, but it's pretty amazing. And they're all kids from Chicago, too, who don't know how to behave. So <laughs> the real challenge. But, uh, but anyway, uh, I taught them a song. I made up a song. Well, actually, I didn't make it up, but, but I knew, a, you know, growing up, playing musical instruments like, like I did, most of you know. Um, I had an older brother who played the trumpet, and he was really good. And I remember him playing this one song. I like to play it on my baritone, too. Um, baritone is a B-flat instrument, uh, at least the one I played was, and, and uh, most trumpets are B-flat trumpets. And so I learned I could read his music, learn to read treble clef and play it. But anyway, there's a song called Bugler's Holiday. Anybody know that? Anybody familiar with that? It goes like this. It's a pretty neat, pretty neat song to play. Fun to play. I love playing it. Anyway, I adapted that to this. And I would teach the kids that. So we'd sing it like this. It's in our book uh, because I sort of adapted the tune, made some changes. So we'd sing like this. Wine, 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 wine is a mocker. Strong, 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 strong drink is raging. Who, 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 whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. And that was it. We just used that portion of the song to drill that truth into these kids. Because a lot of them come from alcoholic homes, you know. So um, anyway, and I remember I'd take time to explain it and teach them. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. And whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. So I want to break this down for you because there's a lot of people that do not understand or that misunderstand what the Bible teaches about wine, strong drink, and so forth. So first thing I want to say, and I'm not going to make this a whole message about it. I could, but I've got a message you can, I don't know if it's online or not. I think, I think it may be, I think the audio is. If not, I'll put it on there if I find out it's not on there. But, but anyway, I taught a priest this uh, several years ago, and um, remember when I handed out Concord grapes, they were in season, and I love Concord grapes. Well, I, I would drive 100 miles to get a, a, a bundle of, a cluster of Concord grapes. That's how much I love them. But anyway, uh, and I had a whole bunch, so I passed them out and shared them with everybody. And uh, mm, man, I tell you, it, and I preached from the, from the subject, the, the verse in the Bible says, wine which maketh glad the heart of man. Because the juice of a Concord grapes makes my heart glad and my <laughs> tongue tingle. And, and I feel like I'm in heaven when I, when I have some Concord grapes. But anyway, uh, the Bible says here, wine is a mock and strong drink is raging. Now, the, Bible, the Bible's use of the word wine is never preceded with fermented or unfermented. And you can have fermented wine or unfermented wine, right? Fermentation is when it rots, when it gets old. And, uh, and so grape juice, you know, you... you you get wine, wine is just from the fruit of the vine. Then you let it, if you store it for too long, it'll start fermenting, yeah. okay? And so, so depending on how long it ferments depends how, how strong it is. 
And so, uh, but you never find the differentiation in the Bible uh, between what kind of wine. There's not two Hebrew words for, that distinguishes it. It's just the same. It just means fruit of the vine. How old it is determines what it does to you, okay? And uh, so the Bible, uh, the only way to tell is by context, or in this case, God blends it with strong drink. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is, it doesn't say and in addition or separately, but wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. So wine that's fermented is a strong drink. All right? And whoso is deceived thereby is not wise. So we can only know by the context and biblical principles whether the wine mentioned in any particular place in the Bible is fermented or not. So let me give you uh, the arguments I hear all the time. Well, Jesus turned water into wine, right? How have you heard that? Is it wrong for a Christian to drink wine? Well, of course not. Jesus turned water into wine, so man, drink up, bottoms up, right? I mean, that's what I hear a lot, okay? Now, let me ask you something. According to this verse, wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging. So do you think Jesus would turn, when Jesus turned water into wine at that marriage celebration, do you think he turned it into something that would mock everybody that drank it? Do you think he turned it into something that would cause people to go into rages? No. no. So he turned it into grape juice, which makes people glad and happy. See. And by the way, that's in John chapter 2 when Jesus turned the... In fact, let's go there. I want, I want you to see it because even the context will tell you common sense that it's not fermented wine. Turn to John chapter 2 and verse 1. The reason I want to spend a little bit of time on this is because the Bible says, whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise, which means that wine itself is a deceiver. See, whosoever is deceived thereby, in other words, by the wine. So there's something about in a certain kind of wine that will deceive you. I've never been deceived by grape juice. I just know it is good, no doubt about it. I've never gotten an argument with anybody over that, about whether grape juice is good, you know, or good for you. All right, now, John chapter 2, verse 1. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. They were invited. And when they wanted, wanted wine, meaning want means to be in lack, in other words, they ran out. When they wanted wine, uh, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. In other words, she said it to Jesus. They have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour not, is not yet come. Now, by the way, I'm going to just throw this in for freebies. Anytime Jesus refers to, to, mother, to, to his mother Mary, he always calls her woman. Never said mother, never said mom in the Bible. Every reference where Jesus speaks to his mother, it's always a woman. Why? She was only a tool to bring him into the world. Only a tool whereby God could become flesh. That's all she was. Other than a decent woman, God's not going to have some prostitute bring his son into the world. So she was a decent woman, but she was not perfect. She was not born sinless because she rejoiced in God her Savior, which means she needed a Savior. She was a sinner and she knew it. And uh, so anyway, uh, Jesus said, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Now it's interesting, Jesus doesn't just walk away. He's not going to let his mother boss him around. That's why he said what he said. Say, what have I to do with thee? What do I have? What do I have to do with you because you say something? Now, it so happens he cares for this couple that invited him. So, when Jesus saw those pots over there, Jesus saith unto them, verse 7, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. So, why? Because Mary told them, do whatever he tells you. And that's a good idea. We ought to do what Jesus tells us to do. And, uh, so, and he saith unto them, they filled up to the brim, and he saith unto them, verse 8, Draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. 
draw out and he needs to take, stick a dipper in there and, and take some out and then carry it to, carry it to the, um, to the uh, governor of the feast, the guy in charge. And, uh, and, and, he's, and when the ruler of the feast, and they bear it, and the, when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, that's our first indication that Jesus had done something. When he had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water, they knew. The governor of the feast called the bridegroom and saith unto him, now watch this, he saith unto him, every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. Now, what kind of wine gets worse in a few hours? Fresh or fermented? Hmm? Yeah, fresh. Ferment is already bad. It's already bad. So it's not going to rot more in a few hours to be, be distinguishable. But fresh, after several hours, and by the way, they had long feasts, sometimes days. Yeah. So, yeah, you can, take, you can tell a difference. It's like I can go out there. We went out there and picked some grapes the other day, and they're on there, but they're kind of squishy and thought, mm, they're not very firm. Mm, taste it. Tasted old starting to ferment already because baking in the sun, the heat and all that. And uh, so anyway, now, so he's talking about fresh wine. People put out the good stuff first. A few hours is not going to make a difference with fermented wine if it's already fermented. But fresh wine, yeah, it can go bad in a few hours uh, sitting out. And so, so that's proof that, that they have a habit of putting out the good stuff first, and then after when people are all drunk, are they not going to notice it as much? Why, you know, because when you've had some, a lot of something, then the quality is not as distinguishable because you've got, you're full and, you know, and uh, you're not thinking uh, about that. You're all in, involved in, in talking and so forth. But boy, when you first, people's first impressions say, you want the best. And so they add fresh wine. And so... So he, this guy's impressed with it. Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. Which means Jesus turned that into fresh, perfect tasting wine. It probably was the best anybody's ever had. Because Jesus made it right there. You know, uh, Lord, I want some of that. <laughs> I can't wait to get to heaven to have some stuff he's made. Amen. Anyway, so, so I wanted you to see that. Um, now, Jesus is not going to turn water into something that is going to make people rage or be a mocker. So Jesus is not going to do that. And now, let me give you another example. Um, in 1 Timothy, uh, let's go over there, where Paul talks to Timothy and gives him some advice. All right, 1 Timothy 5.23 Paul is writing this epistle to Timothy, uh, a young man that he led to Christ. He calls him his son in the faith, and that he caused him to be born again. Uh, preaching the gospel to him, Timothy got saved. And now Timothy is a pastor. And Paul is writing an epistle to him, teach him uh, how to be a preacher and so forth. And he says in verse 23, Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. So Paul is, is, is advising Timothy to not just drink water, but to start drinking grape juice for his stomach's sake. Now, I just believed the Bible when I was a kid. But I'll never forget when I was working in Chicago. I used to work at UPS and uh, the Jefferson Hub. And we stopped on the way home from work, going back to Indiana to the, to the college where I was attending. And we stopped at a Dominic store, and it was about 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning, really, really early. And so almost nobody was in the store. We walked in, we doubled the attendance of the store. Um, anyway, and I went in because I was doing a juice fast at the time, and I needed to get some more grape juice. And so I picked up a bottle of Welch's grape juice. And as I was coming uh, to, the, to the checkout, the manager was walking by, uh, coming towards me. We, and we're about to pass each other. He noticed I was going to the checkout with one item, a bottle of grape juice. 
And he said to me, I'll never forget it. He says, you got stomach problems, huh? That's what he said. You know, bingo, up pot. The Holy Spirit brought this scripture to my mind. Drink a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. See? Grape juice has enzymes in it that helps your digestive tract. Helps it get back on track. <laughs> Play on words. Uh, so it's, that's what it's for. And it's for, good for other things. You know, I've, I've been on two juice fast, two long fasts, two seven-day fasts in my life. Both of them were just grape juice. And I'll tell you this, I worked, I played basketball. I was in the prime of my youth. I was in my 30s, uh, 20s and 30s. And both times, the first couple of days are hard to not eat because, you know, I worked in the dining hall. I'm smelling food and <laughs> making food and serving food and, and cleaning up that food. The food's all around me. And it was tough, but I disciplined myself. I wanted some things from God. I also wanted to cleanse my body out. And I did a juice fast using only grape juice. And I did that for seven days, two different times, years apart. And I played basketball, too. I remember playing basketball on my sixth day. Hadn't eaten in six days. And I played basketball, full court basketball, never ran out of energy. But I had a whole gallon jug. I'd get the gallon ones when I'd go on these seven-day juice fast, you know, big glass gallon jugs they used to have. I had a whole ga gallon on the sidelines. And every once in a while I'd go and go, 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 get some more energy and zoom. I had no problem. I, had, I was not fatigued. I was, oh, I was not emaciated. No, it gave me all I needed, and it cleansed my body, cleansed my, di cleansed my digestive tract, and who knows what all good it did for me. Maybe that's why I'm so young looking. You know, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, not so young looking at the bald head and beard. But anyway, um, but I'll never forget that. Having stomach problems, huh? See? So, now, Jesus is not going to, uh, Paul is not going to tell Timothy to drink wine and risk being deceived by it. So he's not going to tell him to drink something that might deceive him. So clearly, he's talking about unfermented wine, not fermented wine. Because fermented wine, obviously, is deceitful. That's why people think they're someplace and they're not. They think they can jump off a building. They think they can fly. When they get drunk, they think they can beat up the whole world. They think they can do all kinds of things. Why? They deceive themselves. Or not the, no. The wine, the fermented wine, will deceive them. Now, let me show you another verse. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Show you something else that's in, that, that strong drink does or fermented wine does. And another reason why Paul would not have advised Timothy to drink fermented wine and why Jesus would not have turned water into fermented wine at a... At a um, at a wedding that he had been invited to. And they know who he is. He's the Messiah. He's the Savior. He's the Holy One of God. So why would he drink strong drink? All right. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. The Bible says, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, so be not drunk with wine. I've never known anybody to get drunk with fresh grape juice. And I've drunk a lot of it for seven days, Nothing but twice in my life. Never got drunk. I wasn't going up and down the basketball court. Oh, hey, oh, this is fun. Somebody tell me, oh, where's our basket? No, I wasn't doing that. I knew what I was doing. And I played well. I had no loss of energy. I had no loss of mental capacity. Why? Because there's no excess in unfermented wine. It's in fermented wine. There's excess. That's why they say, that's why they can have charged people who are driving under the influence. Why? An undue influence on you that's affecting your ability to steer to know what you're doing. An excess of stuff you don't need. Excess of feeling you're strong. Excess of thinking you can do anything. See? So, I'd love to show you a bunch more, but I, I, I didn't want to take all this time on this. Let me show you one more. Turn to Habakkuk chapter 2. All I'm doing t tonight is showing you why Jesus did not turn water into fermented wine. And why Paul did not. These are, the two, these are the two things people quote saying, see, there's nothing wrong with drinking a little wine. And they do not define. They don't let the Bible define it. They want to make their own definition. See? 
But let God be true and every man a liar. The, the prophecy is not of any private interpretation. The Bible will interpret itself, and that's what I'm letting it do tonight. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 15. Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink. Is it wrong to give your neighbor a drink of water? It's not what it's talking about. Is it wrong to give your neighbor a drink of Kool-Aid or Gatorade? No. Is it wrong to give your neighbor a drink of fresh grape juice? Why would that be wrong? All right. Woe unto him that giveth this. By the way, we have signs. Don't drink and drive. What are they talking about? You know what they're talking about. Stuff that's fermented. You know, can you imagine a police officer? Uh, hey, I see you got a glass of, uh, you got a bottle of Welch's grape juice there. Uh, I, want to, I want you to take a breathalyzer test. <laughs> they're not going to do that. All right? So, <laughs> just common sense, folks. All right, verse, let's read it again. Won't, or let's read the rest. Woe to him that giveth his neighbor drink, that puttest thy bottle to him, and makest him drunken also. And that thou mayest look on their nakedness. Now, of course, now this could talk about homos and queers, you know, faggots getting each other drunk so they can do stuff that otherwise would be kind of repulsive or painful. But if you're drunk, you don't feel as much. By the way, that's what, that's what people do. People, predators on other people, they like to get them drunk. Jeffrey Dahmer, I used to listen to the testimony in court about him. He would get, he'd go to this, these uh, sodomite bars and lure someone to his house, get them drunk, and then he'd drill through their head and kill them. <laughs> then he'd cut their body up in parts and free some of them and put the rest in these barrels of acid that he got. And then he'd save somebody parts to eat later on. How many of you never heard of the Jeffrey Dahmer in that story? Everybody knows about that? Okay, all right. So that's what he did. But he, but he testified, I had to get them drunk. I had to get them, lower their inhibitions and their fears. See? That's why they have things like uh, date pills, date drugs, and so forth. You got to do something, get somebody where they'll be pliable and they won't put up resistance and you can look on their nakedness and you can do whatever you want. Fermented wine will do the same thing. See, people in the world, what do they do? They go on a date and what do they do? If they want to go further than, than, than they think someone else might let them do, hey, would you they offer them a drink. Hey, would you like a drink? And they bring out the alcohol. Why? It lowers people's inhibitions, lowers their resistance. See, and that's what this proves. So, woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink. Well, wait a minute then. If that's what alcoholic drinks would do, fermented wine would do, why would Jesus turn water into fermented wine? He's not going to want to look at anybody's nakedness. He's not going to take advantage of anybody. Why would Paul tell Timothy to do that? He's not going to take advantage of Timothy. You see? So the Bible is so clear if we let it uh, interpret itself. So, now, I think I covered that uh, first. By the way, a lot of people, they, they use it as an excuse in court. Oh, but I was drunk when I did such such. When I beat so-and-so, when I beat my wife. Brother Hiles, his own father used to beat, come home drunk and beat up his mother and sometimes beat him. Why? Because strong drink is raging. You, you, all of a sudden, you can't put up with something that you might otherwise have the grace to put up with. And you fly off the handle about something. Why? You're very touchy. You know, I've heard people say, watch out for so-and-so. You don't want to be around him when he's drunk. Yeah. Why? Because wine is a mocker and strong drink is raging. Well, let me say one thing about wine being a mocker. It means it makes a fool out of you. When I was a kid, we had a, we had, there was this, a man that used to cover, the, our neighborhood knew him as the wino. I never knew his name. We just called him the wino. And people would make fun of him. They would tease him. Why? Because he would stagger down the streets and looking for bottles that had a little bit in them. And, and uh, I'll never forget one time he walked by our neighbor's house. We were at our neighbor's house playing basketball. We saw, hey, here comes the wino. All right, let's have some fun. Hey, wino, want to play basketball? And they threw the basketball to him. Well, he didn't even see it coming, and it hit him. Oh, you don't want to play? Well, oh, try again. And throw it again. And he, 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 he couldn't even grab and catch the ball. Now, that was mean. It was terrible. They shouldn't have done it. I didn't do it. My brothers did My older brothers did it, but I'll never forget it. See? And when I read this, learned this verse, 
That's what always pops in my head. Wine is a mocker. I won't tell you about other things I heard that they did to that man, but, but anyway, it makes a fool out of you. It'll mock you. All right? By the way, that's why people joke about it, you know. Uh, I, I can handle it. I only drink one drink a day. It lasts all day. Ha, ha, ha. People like to imitate that and tell those jokes. Why? Because wine is a mocker. It makes fun of people. And you can make fun of people. Why? It's obvious, all right? So, all right. Second clause, all I'm going to say is those who are deceived by fermented wine and strong drink, they're not wise. So what does that tell us? It's wise to not, not drink it. Don't participate. Don't drink anything that's fermented. All right, let's go to verse 2. The fear of a king is as the roaring of a lion. Whoso provoketh him to anger sinneth against his own soul. Take that first phrase, and just a week or two ago, I guess probably two or maybe three weeks ago, we read a verse very similar. Look back at, in Proverbs to chapter 19, previous chapter we studied, Proverbs 19 and verse 12. And you'll see a verse very similar to this. Proverbs 19 verse 12 says, The king's wrath is as the roaring of a lion. Remember that? The king's wrath is as the roaring of lion. Now Proverbs 20, verse 2 says, The fear of a king is as the roaring of lion. Roaring of lion. Does the fear of a king does the same thing to you that the roaring of lion does? See, when a king, when a king is angry, it ought to make you afraid. Now, we don't have kings, so I want to, you know, and we, we all know that, you know, in the old days, a king can say, off with his head. And soldiers would take the guy and take him out and cut his head off because the king said so. He had the authority. He had the power. He was the, he was the uh, executive branch, the legislative branch, and the judicial branch all wrapped in one. Yeah. See? Too much power in one man's hand. That's why our founding fathers didn't want a monarchy. We split it up and put some checks and balances, which aren't working too well today because we the people just allow government to do whatever they want. And we trust them. we don't say anything about it, don't hold their feet to the fire, which is our fault. But anyway, so we don't have kings. We didn't have a monarchy. We don't have that type of government here in America. What do we have? We have the kind where everybody is their own king, every head of a household anyway. So we have multiple kings. See? So the fear of a king is as the roaring of a lion. We ought to be afraid of our neighbor roaring at us and getting upset with us because we violate his rights or his property, his person. That's the way it ought to be. And your neighbor ought to be afraid of you if he violates your property, your person, or your rights. We have mutual fear one of another or mutual respect one for another. That's the way it ought to be. And then, whoso provoketh him to anger, sinneth against his own soul. You provoke your neighbor, and he gets mad and slugs you or shoots you. It's your fault. You shouldn't have provoked him. See? That's why you have the right, if someone breaks into your house, you have the right to shoot him on sight. Because you don't know if he's got a gun, and, and you got to protect. You have the right to protect your your, pro your life, your wife's life, your children's life, your property. And if someone breaks in, you don't have time to uh, give them a questionnaire. Here, fill this out. What, what is the purpose of your visit? You know, yeah. in the dark? <laughs> you don't know what he's got or what he's doing or what he's got pointed at you. You see? And so if someone shoots someone who has broken into their house, it's called justifiable yeah. homicide. You're justified and killing them. If someone is about to kill somebody else, you have the right to save that other person's life by killing them. If someone's about to shoot you, you have the right to shoot them first if you can to preserve your own life or the life of your, if you're married, the, wife of your, the life of your wife's husband. <laughs> if you've got children, you have the right to preserve the, the father, the life of the father of your children. So if you provoke your neighbor to wrath, you sin against yourself. Provoke means to, means to, you cause it. You do something that causes them to be angry. Um, all right, let's go to verse 3. It is an honor for a man to cease from strife, but every fool will be meddling. 
Now, it seems like we should never, ever strive, doesn't it? Wait a minute, isn't there times to strive for just causes? You know, we sing songs, the strife will not be long. We're supposed to strive. The Bible tells us to strive. The Bible says contend for the faith. So, but this is not a general statement here. It's very specific. And wisdom will dictate what it means. And I'll explain it to you. It is an honor for man to cease from strife. So if you're in a legitimate fight over something you have a lawful right to fight about, does this mean it's wise to just stop? Obviously, no. Doesn't mean that. Here's what it means. You ever see two guys fighting? And one of them says, wait a minute, what are we fighting about? I forget. <laughs> Let's stop. I mean, we're about to get hurt here. And the other guy says, I don't know. Well, you said something. I can't remember what it was, but it made me mad. Yeah, I know, but we don't, if, if you can't remember, I don't remember. Let's, I'm ready to stop. You ready to stop? Call a truce. They shake hands and become friends. <laughs> they don't remember. Why? That's an honorable thing to do. Or if you realize that you've meddled in someone else's business and they're mad and, they, and strife has started because you meddled with your neighbor's business, then it's honorable for you to say, you know what? You know what? S uh, stop. I shouldn't have meddled in your business. I stuck my nose in your business, none of my business, and I, I apologize. Let's not fight. I'll respect your business. I'll respect your person, your property, your, your rights, and I'm very sorry. Eat your humble pie. Stop the strife. That's what this is meaning. You know, we're not supposed Paul did not stop fighting for his rights in the book of Acts. He appealed all the way to Caesar. See? See, he didn't start the strife. Somebody violated his rights. When someone violates your rights, you don't have to, and it's cause of strife. It's not an honorable thing to stop. It's honorable to win, finish it, win. So wrong does not prevail. See, it was, it was honorable for David to knock Goliath's head off. <laughs> I mean, to throw that sling, sling that rock and, and kill him, then chop his head off. That was an honorable thing to do. David should have said, hey, let's all stop. No, because the Philistines said, oh, you don't want to fight? Okay, then, then you become our servants. You have a right to defend your liberties. You have a right to defend your property. You have light, a right to defend your person. And such strife that results from that is not what this is talking about. It's talking about the kind of strife where you meddle in someone's business, where you argue about something that's superfluous. You know, what's the point? Oh, hey, I saw, I saw a shooting star. That was no shooting star. That was fireworks. No, it was a shooting star. No, it was fire. You calling me a liar? Yeah, I'm calling you a liar. <laughs> yeah, hey, you know, that's not worth fighting about. Let's just stop. That's the honorable thing to do is stop when you're striving over stuff that's not worth striving for. Because, see, it is an honor to strive for that which is right. All right, now... Okay, let's go on to verse 4. I think that's pretty much... Oh, by the way, the next phrase that proves it. Every fool will be meddling. See, that's what it's talking about. The context will tell you. Every fool. That means wise people don't meddle. Wise people don't get in strife. If they do, when they realize it, they stop. They cease. See? But a fool, he's going to go on meddling, go on striving, getting his nose bloodied for no good reason. All right, verse 4. The sluggard will not plow by reason of the cold, therefore shall he beg in harvest and have nothing. I've loved this verse. When I used to live in Indiana, it really meant something to me. You know, those farmers, they've got to get out there and plow in the fall. They've done their harvest, and then you've got to process your harvest, and then fall comes, and the farmer wants to take a break. Oh, I worked hard all summer long, and and in planting, and then watering, and weeding, and hoeing, and, and all the stuff it takes, and clearing, and, uh, and, and breaking ground first so he can plant. And then he had the harvest, and some things harvest quicker than others, so he's like busy all summer. His uh, animals or cows are calving, you know, during the winter and late, er, early spring, and so forth, and, and he's just busy. He's ready for a break, but in the fall, before the ground gets hard, you better plow that ground again and fertilize it so that it can sit during the wintertime. But sometimes in the fall, you have cold days. 
a farmer or a gardener goes out, ah, I don't want to plow, it's cold. He's going to regret it. Why? Because then it's going to get colder. He won't be able to plow the ground. And then the ground's going to be, what do you call it, fallow. Because he didn't get the fertilizer on it, didn't get it turned. And then he's not going to get good crops. He's going to beg and harvest. So the point here is when it's time to do something, do it. Do it when you have time. If you're not willing to make an investment in the future that is necessary to survive, then you deserve to have to beg or to starve. So work when you don't feel like it. Work because it needs to be done. Do a task because it's necessary. Otherwise, you starve. You do without. Okay? Next verse, verse 5. Counsel in the heart of man is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. I love this verse. Counsel in the heart of a man is like deep water. We've looked at this verse before. We looked at other verses that have to do with counsel earlier in the chapter, but so I'll just review briefly. So counsel in the heart of man is like deep water. It's, here's a comparison. Counsel, in other words, wisdom and knowledge that, that, that people have and understanding that people have in their hearts, it's like a d deep water, a deep well. A man of understanding is going to recognize that somebody has knowledge and counsel in their heart. And they're going to take a bucket when they go to meet with them and ask questions. They're going to let that bucket down and try to draw out of that person the knowledge that they have, the wisdom they have. See? So let me illustrate. For 10 years, I got to cut Dr. Heil's hair. I became his personal barber. So guess what? Every two weeks when I cut his hair, I had a 3 by 5 card. I took time before I went to write down questions I wanted to ask him. Why? Man, I'm cutting on that head and thinking, what all's in there? What does he know? I wanted to draw it out. I wanted some of what he had. So I would ask questions. I'd go prepared. I didn't go and try to impress him with my knowledge. That would have been foolish. He knew, he'd forgot more than I knew, see. So I went prepared to ask him stuff, not to tell him and try to impress with my little peon brain, my peon level of knowledge. I would draw it out. I'd ask him, what, what, what about this? What about that? And so forth. So I wish I'd kept all those cards. Um, that'd been neat. But I learned a long time ago because I've got all kinds of notes from Bible college. I've never read my notes. In fact, I found the box that has them in there. I got notebooks and notebooks with all kinds of dividers for different courses. And I got all my notes, not all, but I got a lot of notes from my Bible colleges. I have never read them all these years. I don't have time. That's why the most important thing is that you remember what you hear. Give attendance to what you hear. Because you don't have time to go back and read what you're writing down. Why? You're hearing more. See? I don't mind folks taking notes in church, but you know what I'd rather? You listen so intently that you remember it. Because a lot of times you won't go back and read your notes. It's kind of nice for people to take notes because they say, hey, did I, where did I leave off last week? And some go, oh, let's see, I wrote down, oh, yeah. But just because they have that doesn't mean they remember everything I taught. You remember what makes an impression on you. And so the, I like the Bible terms, give ear, incline thine ear unto my law. Hearken. See, what you do with your ears is way more important than what you do with your hand and your fingers and your ink pen. So what you do with your ink pen is going to be in a file somewhere. But what you do with your ears is going to be there if you're paying attention long enough. So, counsel in the heart of man is like deep water, but a man of understanding, which means a fool, is going to be around a guy who's got a lot of knowledge and wisdom and information. He's going to talk about the weather and all kinds of things and talk about things he'd like to try to impress and tell stories about himself. But a wise man is going to draw out. A man of understanding is going to draw out. He's going to understand, I don't know that much. And here's someone who knows more. He's lived longer, so forth. That's why the age in man, young people should go to older people and ask them, hey, what was it like when you did this? And that? Why, they've got a wealth of information. I guarantee you, Brother Brower knows way more than all three of you young men put together. You say, can you guarantee it? Yeah, I can. I, I'll, I'll put life on that. I think so. Let's go to verse 6. 
Most men will proclaim every one his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. Boy, what a great verse. Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness. Boy, that's kind of like, uh, kind of like what I was talking about. You be on a wise man and talk about yourself. Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness. Most folks like to talk about how smart they are, how rich they are, you know, what good deals they got, uh, where they went to college, and what kind of grades they got, and what kind of girls they dated, and, and they, they talk about their own goodness. And, and in Christian circles in particular, Oh, yeah, I used to go to such such a church. My pastor is so-and-so, you know, and, and uh, you know, I want to, you know, I, I, like, I like going to Bible conferences, but there's something I hate about Bible conferences. Sometimes everybody's trying to talk about their church being the best or their preacher being the best and all this stuff. And, and uh, so, but, but anyway, you understand, most men, no, by the way, God's honest here, not everybody, but most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness. Boy, don't we get that out soul winning. Hey, if you die, die today, do you know for sure you go to heaven? Yeah, I think I will. Okay, what makes you think you go to heaven? Well, I'm, I'm not that bad a person. I think, I think I'm a pretty good person. I think, I think I'm okay. God will let me in. You know, I'm honest. I work hard and I take care of my children. And we hear that all the time, don't we? See, most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness. And look at the next phrase. But a faithful man who can find. Oh, by the way. Before I go to that, turn to Proverbs 27. We're going to go jump ahead and look at a verse that, that, that's a good, what I call a good mate uh, for this verse. A good matching verse or a good, they're a good match. Proverbs 27, verse 2. Let another man praise thee and not thine own mouth, a stranger and not thine own lips. See, it's better if somebody else boasts about you than if you boast about yourself. Um, sometimes I'll tell about things that I did just because I want you to get to know me a little bit and learn some lessons that I learned. But I always like when other people can vouch my stories. <laughs> See? And so it was kind of fun. One time I was in pastor school, and I told you a story about going to Chicago and, and ripping the nunchucks out of the hands of a gang guy that was doing it in my face trying to intimidate me. Remember that story? Well, there's a guy with me that day named Danny. Uh, his brother pastors in New Mexico. Goes to the conference. Um, da Danny Rogers, yeah. Danny Rogers. Well, I was at pastor school one of the last times I ever went there, which is years ago, about 12 years ago, I guess. And, uh, and I saw Brother Rogers there. He was with his pastor, Chuck Manis, who I used to play basketball with. So if you want to call, call Chuck Manis, pastor of some church, I think in uh, Ohio. Uh, what's the name? Something Ohio. Anyway, uh, but anyway, Danny Rogers was with him, with him, and I said, "Brother," and I hadn't seen him since that year, pretty much. And I said, "Is that you, brother Danny Rogers?" And I walked up to him. He said, "Is that you, Tim Cole?" And I said, "Yep, it's me." And then right away, oh, I so I said to his pastor, brother Chuck, who I used to play basketball, I says, "Wow, I haven't seen him in years. Where did he come from?" And we talked, and and he said, "Yeah, I've been around, but now I'm working in his church and helping him out." And then Brother Rogers said to, said to Brother, Brother uh, Manus, he says, this guy is crazy. I remember, and he told the story. <laughs> told the story. I took those new checks right out of that guy's hands. And, uh, so anyway, it's kind of fun to do it. But it's better to, it's better to hear someone else tell a story yeah. than when you tell it yourself. So it, it always is. So let another man. Uh, uh, lost my place. Let another man praise thee. And not thine own lips, a stranger, not thine own, or not thine own mouth, a stranger, not thine own lips. Now let's go to the second clause of verse five of chapter twenty. A man of understanding. I'm sorry, of verse six. A faithful man who can find. A faithful man is a man who does what he does because God says to do it. No matter what anybody else thinks or says. He just does what he knows he ought to do. He's got faith in God, and he does it. He's not doing it to build up a reputation. He's not doing it so he can have some story to tell. He was doing it because he ought to do it. See? So a lot of the things that I've done in the past, I've told stories about, I did them because I thought I ought to do it. See? Like the time I played basketball, and this guy pushed me, undercut me, when I went up for layup. 
And in the middle of the air, I realized it was going to land on my back. And I decided in that split second that I'm not going to show that it hurt at all. And I'm going to jump up as fast as I could. See? Why? Because I believe that he was wrong. And he's trying to intimidate me. And I didn't think God wanted me to be intimidated by some punk who breaks the rules and fouls and, and uh, thinks he can get away with it. So I wanted to show him, you can hurt me if you want to, but, but you're going to have to answer to me because I'm getting right up and it's not going to hurt. So I hit that ground, boom, and I literally bounced almost up to my feet. I mean, I was up in a split second, and I didn't even look at him. I didn't even acknowledge him. I just ran back. And what he planned to hope, what he hoped uh, that I'd limp off, I'm sure he probably couldn't believe his eyes. And that's what I wanted. But the reason I wanted it because I had faith that I had the right to play. And if I'm better than him, and I, if I, I blocked his shot earlier, by the way, and so he was mad. And, uh, and he was a real good basketball player. Played, for, played in high school, was a star on his high school, one of the stars on his high school team. And he thought he was all that. And I never even played high school. Uh, just just um, playground, you know, street, street ball or whatever. But anyway, so I just had faith. I have a right to play as much as he is, just, just even if I don't have the pedigree. His dad was a wealthy deacon in the church. My dad even didn't even go to the church. He, I was from out of state. Anyway, I, I just had faith that God wanted me to show that he is not going to intimidate me. That I'm not going to have the fear of man. The fear of man bringeth a snare. I want to make sure he knows I'm not afraid of him and he can't hurt me. So I, 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 do, I do stuff like that. Why? I'll do what I do by faith. I want to live by faith. I want to walk by faith. I want to work by faith. I want to preach by faith. I want to teach by faith. I want to go sowing by faith. And I want to help people by faith. So do what you do by faith. Be a faithful man. See? A faithful man who can find. They're very rare. They are very rare. Compared to most men who proclaim every man his own goodness. <laughs> See? All right. We'll stop there. That's a good stopping point. We'll start with verse 7 next week. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the Bible study. Thank you for the a wealth of wisdom that we got to see and touch on tonight. I pray that you would work in our hearts individually and, and shine the spotlight on the things that we need spotlight shine, uh, shown on individually. You know each of us has, you know what each of us needs and we may have different needs and I just pray that your spirit will work in our hearts and, and cause us to hearken unto the things that were said tonight and that you would also bless us with the ability to meditate on these things and maybe even come up with some truths and comparisons and other scriptures uh, that, come, that, bring, that you can bring to our minds that will help us that I didn't say, that I didn't bring up. So bless us with your wisdom uh, according to our need, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.